Amen. Thank you, Ray. It's great to be with you guys. Uh, if you would, open to Philippians 3. Uh, we are going to start in Philippians 3 in just a moment to have some continuity with what I understand you guys have been in as a, as a people and as a church moving through Philippians. Um, but my goal is to kind of go somewhere uh, on our way through Philippians 3. And, and what I mean by that is that my hope and my goal this morning is that you would be encouraged, in particularly in light of this time of, of year, the season that we're in. And what I mean by that is that, is that I am coming this morning to the Word uh, with the awareness that next week is Palm Sunday, and the following week is Easter, okay? So already here we are in the spring, and next week the church all over the world will remember Palm Sunday, which is when Jesus entered Jerusalem, and then following that we have Passion Week, what is called Passion Week, where we remember the story and the sufferings of Jesus leading to Good Friday, where we remember his death, and then Easter Sunday, where we, of course, remember his resurrection. And so my, my hope and desire this morning is that the Lord meets us, meets you, in, uh, through the word in a way where you would be encouraged to be very intentional in this season and that a miracle would happen. And that miracle might not be what you think of when you hear the word miracle. But to me, what I'm thinking of is miraculous. And that is that we would be able to find, all of us, an hour or whatever it is for you of quiet, undistracted time where we are preoccupied with the story of Jesus and the Gospels. And in our lives of busyness, in the onslaught of distraction, that feels miraculous to me. Like when that happens for me, when that happens for you, it feels miraculous when we can carve out that space and have intentional, undistracted time in this season of the church calendar where we can just focus on Jesus and focus on his story. And I love this season. I love Christmas as well. Um, I, I love celebrating Advent and the birth of Jesus, but there's something special to me about this season of the year because we don't know exactly when Jesus was born, but we do know when Jesus died, right? Because he died at Passover, and so we have this gift of sacred time, if you will, in the Jewish calendar, and every year that the church celebrates Easter, it coincides roughly with Passover. And so we know when Jesus died. We can remember him in a very specific way. It's not just conjecture. It's not just a guess. And so the, the gift of this season is that we can slow down and we can remember him and remember his story in a very specific way. But, but how does that miracle of remembrance happen? How, how can we be compelled toward that? And that's where I want to start in Philippians 3. And I'm just going to pray and ask the Lord to, to help me, and then we'll look at his word in Philippians 3. Lord, we love you this morning. We come in our weakness. Lord, I pray for those who are hurting and suffering this morning, that they would be encouraged through your word, that they would be encouraged through finding an anchor of your worth and your glory that is firm and steadfast. Lord, I ask you to open the eyes of our understanding, that you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we need your help. We need your intervention, God. Lord, please help us this morning to see and to hear and to understand for the sake of your name. Amen. So Philippians 3, look at verse 7 and 8 with me. Hopefully a familiar passage, um, even irrespective of, of this series on Philippians. 
hopefully a familiar passage to you. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted loss for the sake of Christ. And at that point, I can, I'm, I'm like with Paul, that seems reasonable enough to me, okay, because he's kind of talking about his former life in Judaism, which he's just talked about. <clears throat> he says, I have so much reason to boast in the flesh, more than all of you. But he says, whatever was gained to me, I count loss, okay? But then verse 8 is where it gets more invasive and incisive to me. Paul says, more than that, I count all things to be loss. All things to be loss. In view of the surpassing value of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them rubbish so that I may gain Christ. So, Maybe a familiar passage, maybe not. But either way, we need to take a step back and realize the enormity of what Paul is saying here. Okay, Paul is saying and declaring that there is something of value. Okay, it's something of worth. And I'm going to use the word treasure. Okay, because we're going to see in a second, that's the word Paul uses. He doesn't use that word here, but it's the same idea. He says surpassing value or surpassing worth. That's a treasure, right? So Paul says there is a treasure that is so weighty in its glory. There is a treasure that is so supremely surpassing value and worth that it makes all things that you could aspire to, all ambitions, any other sort of gain, it makes that look like loss in comparison. He's putting it on the scales right before our eyes. And he's saying, there's a treasure that is so vast and so great that any other gain is rubbish in comparison. All things, right? That's the thing that gets you. It's the all things. It's not, okay, fine, Paul, your former way of life. He says, all things. He reckoned as rubbish in light of the surpassing value and treasure of... Of course, it says what it is, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So there's a treasure here that we need to see and discover and value. And for us this morning, it probably is a reckoning. And what I mean by that is that we have to reckon this to be true. It's a statement of faith for us. It's an assent and agreement of going on the line in our heart and saying, Lord, I'm just going to esteem your word. I'm just going to believe your word because our problem is we can't uh, weigh this or evaluate this for ourselves just by logic, by, by, by like having our emotions or our logic tested out. We can't logic this out to determine whether it's true. In the most practical real life way which we're going to get to in a moment like at in the late evening when you're making decisions and you just feel shattered by the day you can't weigh this and be like what's my treasure right now because i promise if you're a human being in this fallen evil age you're probably not just going to have this overwhelming surge of well of course duh it's the knowledge of jesus Like, what else would I do this evening? Right? What else could I imagine giving my attention to right now when I feel like I'm going to die at the end of the day? Right? Everything else in that moment is competing for our attention. That's the battleground of our sanctification. Everything else seems to be appealing and... and, uh, enticing us for us to give our attention to it for us to venerate it and esteem it and this is why there's something here that we have to reckon by faith and believe Jesus you are precious whether in my emotions or in my thoughts it feels that way or not okay so turn with me to Colossians 2 because I want to explore this reality of treasure more because it has to be 
real. It can't just be, this wasn't theoretical for Paul. This wasn't like abstract and conceptual for Paul. It's a real person. It's a real man. So Colossians 2, and on our way there, you don't have to turn there, okay? Colossians is just the next book over, so we won't go in the other direction, but... um, What's one of the many passages that is, are, is stunning to me is Ephesians 3.8. And again, you don't have to turn there but because I'm just going to say it for you, okay? This, this reality of the worth and the riches, this treasure that is Christ Jesus, Paul framed his entire ministry in this way. He says, to me this grace was given. Look, there it is. To me, this grace was given, the very least of all the saints, to preach to the Gentiles or to the nations, that's the same word, to preach to the nations the unfathomable riches of Christ. And if you keep reading just a little bit in Ephesians 3, it's very clear it's the riches of his glory. Okay? Do you see the connection here with Philippians 3.8, right? Ephesians 3.8, Philippians 3.8. Philippians 3.8, Paul says there's this surpassing worth. There's this surpassing treasure of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And Paul here in Ephesians 3.8 says, my, my, this grace was given to me. My ministry is about making known the mystery of the unsearchable riches of glory found in Jesus. <clears throat> what a statement. That this was, this was the reality that Paul lived in. Again, it wasn't just theoretical or abstract. It's, it was his ministry and his message to proclaim the infinite, unsearchable treasure of the person of Jesus. And we want to see him this way. We want to know him this way. Even if, if, if it barely moves us this morning, at least that we would want to want to see it, right? At least that we would just be, Lord, help me to see it. Help me to see you rightly, to treasure you rightly, and to see what is actually there, because it is actually there. The problem is with us. The problem is our dullness. The problem is our distraction. The problem is not with Christ. Okay, there is no deficiency in his glory. By the power of the Holy Spirit, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul declares that his glory is unsearchable. You can't trace it out. You can't reach the bottom of it. It's real. It just is waiting to be searched out, and we need eyes to see. Okay, so Colossians 2. That's where we are. Colossians 2, verse 2 that your heart may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining, here it is again, okay, all the wealth, same language, right? All the wealth that you, Paul is, is praying, his struggle is in prayer, for the church in Colossae, that they would attain to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all, all of what? The treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Here we are again, right? Paul says... That in a person, in a man, are hidden all, that's the word that gets me, right? All, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in a person who is the mystery of God. And just a few verses down in verse 9, Paul says, who is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, or the fullness of deity bodily. 
That is where all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Okay? And I, I, my guess is that you're here this morning because on some level, I mean, just some base level, okay? And th that's fine. I'm not being, by the way, like I'm at that base level, okay? I'm not being condescending, right? Here we are, okay? At this, at some level, we're like, yeah, I, I want that. Right? Like, I, yeah, I guess I, I do actually want the treasures of wisdom and knowledge of God. Right? Like, I want to know God. Right? Okay, amen. Praise God. Like, what? Like, I'm, I'm, true, I'm not being condescending. Seriously. Like, why are we here? Right? Like, why are we here? Okay? Because you're, you're here, I'm assuming, this morning, because on some level, you're like, yeah, I do need God, and I want to know him, right? Okay, so Paul says that all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge of God are found in a person, in a man who is the mystery of God and, and who was the fullness of deity bodily. Again, that's verse 9, just a little bit down in Colossians. So that's where they are, right? That's why he is precious. That's why there is treasure there to be found and to be searched out because it is hidden in him. So there's something to access. There's something to tap into that we have to find. So how do we do that? How do we find it? Okay, turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4. This is obviously, not only is it all inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's all Paul's writings in Philippians, Colossians, and Corinthians. So there is common language which helps us, but, but more importantly, it's common truths, right? There's a pathway of truth leading us into reality. So 2 Corinthians 4 We can start in verse 4-ish. Um, the minds of the unbelieving have been blinded. And then Paul says, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Fantastic, but keep reading. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power would be of God and not of us. Okay, do you see it again, right? The word treasure. It's the only other place in the New Testament where the word is used, the specific word for treasure. Colossians 2, 2 Corinthians 4. Okay, we have this treasure. What's the treasure? In context, it's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's our treasure. The light of of the knowledge. Notice that word knowledge. What did we see in Philippians 3.8? The surpassing value of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Colossians 2. All of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.6. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's the treasure. How did it get there? It got there through a miracle. What miracle? the type of miracle of Genesis 1, God saying, let there be light. That's how it got there. So we are desiring the miracle of God's decree speaking into our hearts 
so that we would have a spiritual capacity to behold the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Okay, and if you're sitting there and you're like, Brother Stephen, I don't feel that. I mean, welcome to the club, okay? Like literally yesterday or the day before, I can't remember exactly, within the past two days, I'm sitting at my desk in front of 2 Corinthians 4, pleading with God to do this in me, okay? It, you, we never, like, we never move beyond our need for this, okay? We are asking God to do it all over again. Maybe, maybe you, you, you feel like there's been a measure of this in your life in the past. Maybe you don't. It doesn't matter, we need God to speak again like he did in the beginning and decree, command, light to shine in our inner man so that we could behold something. And that something is a treasure. And that treasure is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's where it is. Okay, but there's one more very important question. Okay. Okay. Paul has located this treasure for us in the face of Christ, okay? But what does that mean, <laughs> right? What does the face of Christ mean? I think it means his face, <laughs> okay? I'm just going to go on the line, and I think face means face, Okay, but here's what I mean by that. When Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, okay, this is well after the ascension, of course, right? Jesus was not physically on the earth anymore, right? They, they couldn't see his physical face any more than you and I can. He was gone. Paul had seen his face at least, at least once clearly on the road to Damascus, I think more than that. But Paul had seen his face, but the church in Corinth hadn't seen his face. So how is Paul commending this to them? Like, what are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to see his face? And for our purposes, how are we supposed to see his face? If we don't answer that question, the whole thing breaks down. And this is at best just a good idea, and it can't stay there. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, I think to me the clearest answer is by faith to find the most accurate portrait of him and what he was actually like. Because he had a real face. He still has a real face. He is forever a glorified Man, and he had a face with cheekbones, with a jaw, with a beard, with eyes. Okay, and so how do we behold his face? Well, the clearest and really the only, the only, we have many truths about Jesus in the Bible, but the only actual portrait of him that we have of his character, of his teaching, of his words, of how he interacted with people is in the four Gospels. The 89 chapters that we have that describe his life for us and give him and give us a picture of him where we can actually, by faith, through the word, with the help of the Holy Spirit, in prayer, behold his face. We can actually get to know him. This is not ethereal or complex. It's so simple, but I understand it requires an enormous degree of intentionality because we actually have to shift gears and we have to come to his word and specifically come to the story of, his, of the gospels and we need to set our hearts to get to know him for his sake and on his terms. And what I mean by that is this. We have been groomed to read the Bible based on impact, interest, and inspiration. 
We want, if we read the Bible at all, we want to read something that will impact us, that we're interested in, and that will inspire us. The problem that we face when we're coming to the Gospels is that maybe as much or more than any other part of the Bible, it just simply isn't about us. It's about him. It's about where he went in places that unless we've looked it up, we have no idea where they are. Talking to people and groups of people, categories of people who we have absolutely no knowledge of. Him doing things and interacting with with characters that initially have, have no relevance or application to us. And we have to shift gears and and be willing to come to him and get to know him simply because we love him and we love his story and we care about him. Rather than simply looking for what will apply to us in the moment. The most normal thing in the world if you love someone is to get to know them. And as you get to know someone, that's what causes you to love them. So we need to, to, in this season particularly of Palm Sunday and Easter, we need to come to him just for him, just to get to know his story. My hope and desire in this season for you, as you set your heart in this way, as you read his word, is that Easter and the remembrance of the death and the resurrection of Jesus would not merely just be a a formula, so to speak, of how your sins were forgiven, but it would actually be the story of someone who you love. Think about how Mary and, there's like a number of them, Mary Magdalene was who was in my mind. Think about how Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John. Think about how the preaching of the cross landed for them. The cross was not a message. The cross was not a doctrinal construct of justification by faith where they were like a variable in an equation and they got the forgiveness of sins out of it. They did. They did have their sins forgiven through faith in him. But more than that, the cross was the story of a brutal death of someone who they loved, of someone who they actually cared about. It was a gut-wrenching memory of blood and of pain and of tears. And we cannot, of course, fully replicate their experience, their eyewitness testimony, but through his word and through an intentional posture of heart, we can actually enter into a friendship and a fellowship with him where his story actually matters to us. Okay? And I just want to give you one example of this. Because I, I want to make it real. I want to make it tactile. Okay? We're almost done. But turn with me, if you have your Bible, and I think we'll have it up on the screens as well. But turn with me to John eleven fifty four. At first, I mean, many of you are already reading it because it's on the screens. At first, this appears so random. And on one level, it is. And that's exactly why I want to talk about it. Because it demonstrates the the reality that I'm trying to uh, communicate this morning. John eleven fifty four. therefore Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, 
but went away from there to a country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. To put this in just a minute or two of context, Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. Okay? The Feast of Dedication, which is more familiar to us as Hanukkah, had just happened in December, okay? Just like it does in real life, like the Bible actually happened, okay? So the Feast of Dedication had happened, John 10, 22, right? This is John eleven fifty four. Can you can we switch? Yeah, 54, stay on 54. The Feast of Dedication had just happened in John 10, 22, in December. Now it's approaching Passover, right? Which was in March, April, just like it is for us. Okay, so you have this window of several months leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And they had wanted to kill him at the Feast of Dedication. He had gone past out beyond the Jordan. But if you remember, he had come back. And why? He had come back because Mary and Martha had sent to him and told him that Lazarus was dying. And so kind of against all odds and certainly against all human wisdom, Jesus comes back. He comes back to right on the doorstep of Jerusalem and Bethany because he loved them, it says. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and Mary and her brother. I love that passage. He loves everybody, right? We know that, for God so loved the world. But it it says particularly that he loved them. He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So he comes back. And of course, I hope that you know the story where he raises Lazarus from the dead. Spectacular, right? On the surface, if we were going to talk about something in this window of time before the death of Jesus, it would be that. But after this, right, some people are uh, just understandably in awe of the miracle, they believe in him. But it says other people went and they told the leaders of Jerusalem what Jesus had did. And we, and we find at the end of John, okay, right before this, there's a council. And, it, and it's a council that really uh, galvanized the final uh, plan and conspiracy to kill Jesus. So this, this was very... Jesus knew it, it was very intentional, and it was, it was at a point where it was leading to his imminent death. And then this is the last verse that we have. This is the last notice that we have of Jesus before his final journey to Jerusalem and his entry that we will celebrate in Palm Sunday next week. This is it, Okay. John eleven fifty four. he walked no longer among the Jews because they wanted to kill him, but he went away from there into the country called the wilderness, a country near the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed. Now, if we are approaching the Gospels where our primary goal is just to figure out something that we can get from it, something that will apply to us, okay, This is a throwaway verse, right? Because literally, I don't know. Like, I I don't, I mean, people do whatever, but I don't know how you could make this apply to you, right? Like, what in this passage can we draw some principle or platitude to make it about you in this verse? So if, if that's our goal in coming to the Gospels, we will find nothing here. But if our goal in coming to the Gospels, first and foremost, is to know him and to know his story, this is a doorway into so many questions and so much opportunity for friendship. Like, literally, I am stuck here. And, and have been stuck here a number of times because it's just crazy to me that this happened. Why? 
If we just think about it for a moment, there are so many questions that should arise about Jesus from this one verse, this seemingly obscure verse. It's the last place he was before he went on the journey to Jerusalem and then entered the city and and what we celebrate as Passion Week. Hardly, that no one knows exactly where this was. I, you can look at every commentary, every, every, you know, archaeological article, whatever, whatever. No one knows exactly where this place called Ephraim was. Why did Jesus go there? And what did he do there? How long was he there? What did he talk about? What did he teach his disciples? What did they do? Whose house did he stay at? He didn't sleep in a field, right? Like he was actually with someone. Someone had fellowship with him during this time. Who was it? Why? There's so many questions. And the point is not that that we're waiting for some answer. Like in other words, that we need to go beyond the boundary lines of scripture. The point is, in reading his story, there's this period. It could, this, he could have been in Ephraim for two or three weeks, easily, if you put together the chronology. This, he could have been there for two or three weeks, and we know nothing about it. And so, as I am reading his story and searching him out, right, this is where the treasure is found. This is precious to me. Because I love him and I actually want to know him. And this is where we have to esteem and reckon his word. That over and above any other thing that we could aspire to, any other ambition that we could have, the moments that we will spend meditating on John eleven fifty four 54 and asking him questions about Ephraim are more precious than anything else that we could acquire. Think about it. When you die, everything is going to be zeroed out. It doesn't matter at that point. But our knowledge of him is eternal. And beyond just being eternal, it is the most valuable and precious thing that we could give our attention to. What if in the age to come, we actually can talk with Jesus and he's like, you spent an inordinate amount of time on John eleven fifty four. 54. So I just thought I would tell you about it. Because it actually happened. The disciples have real memories of John eleven fifty four, 54. Because Jesus is a real person. Okay? This isn't a fairy tale. This was in a real place that he really went to for a real reason and stayed at a real person's house and had real fellowship with real Jewish men who were his disciples. And I want to find him there, leading up to Palm Sunday, because that's where he was. And I want to be with him. And I just want to know him. And so I'm going to sit in front of his word and mostly be bored, but ask him questions. Believing that that beholding is the wisest thing that we could give our attention to because he is treasure. And if we reckon him that way, then that miracle might be able to take place of 30 minutes or an hour in the midst of our busyness during this season where we actually remember his death and we remember the story of someone whom we love. Amen. Go ahead and stand.
I just want to pray for you as the team comes and leads us back into worship for a moment. But as you're responding to the Lord, I want this to be so concrete to you, <laughs> meaning, okay, Lord, I'm just going to read the Gospels. I'm just going to try it. I'm going to do it, okay? <laughs> I'm going to set my heart, and I am going to try to carve out time to remember you because I want to know you because I believe that you are precious. Not because I feel it, but because your word says it. And I'm just going to go with you because that's all I have at the end of the day, right? Like, what else do we have besides his word? God alone is wise. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to set my heart to just read your word. To, and specifically, I, I love, I mean, read anything, but specifically, I am going to give my attention to the story of your life that we have in the Gospels. So much of each of the Gospels is given over to the story of the last few months of his life before the cross and the resurrection. There is so much to read. There is so much detail. And every detail is an invitation. It's an invitation into the Colossians 2, 2, and 3 that all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in him. They're hidden in him. And it's in the details. And you taking those and you talking to a real person who remembers those details because he lived them, talking to him about his life. That's how we begin to access those treasures that are hidden. And so that's what I want to encourage you to just set your heart. It's, it's so simple. It's not ethereal. It's not complex. If you don't know where to start, just start somewhere. You can't, you can't do it wrong. The Lord will help you. Like, you can't make a mistake. Like, just open his word and be like, this is boring, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Okay, welcome again to life under the sun in this present evil age with a dull heart. Like, that is normal. That is normal, real Christianity. Okay, but that is our invitation. And in time, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will grow in conformity to Paul's confession that that is a surpassing treasure for which we would even lose all things. So Lord, I ask you to help us, Lord. God, in our weakness, in our frailty, in our boredom, in our distraction, I ask you to do a miracle that you would apprehend our hearts and that you would be our treasure. Lord, I ask you for the gift of sight this morning. I ask you for the gift of revelation that you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding to see you as you are, to see you rightly, to esteem you as the surpassing treasure which you are. Lord, I ask for a, an invitation by your spirit to search out those treasures of wisdom and knowledge which are found in Christ Jesus, who is the mystery of God. Help us, Lord, escort us into these riches, into these treasures that are unsearchable. We love you and exalt you. Lord, I ask you for your power and your presence in our midst right now to seal our hearts in the truth of your word for the sake of your name.